Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on this week's video. On this week's video, we're in our sixth and final session of our new program entitled The Presidential Cases. And these are the medical, legal, game-changing cases that have occurred over the past 10 to 15 years that are still relevant to the evaluations that we perform even today. These are cases that have had dramatic impact on the financial issues associated with each and every injured worker evaluation. And of course, specifically, these cases revolve around the delicate and sensitive and financially um, pivotal issues such as permanent impairment and apportionment. And I have a fascinating discussion for you today that combines both of those issues, both permanent impairment and apportionment issues and resolves difficult disputes between both of those issues and significantly impacts the financial conclusion of the case. In this case, the Benson case, which is the topic of today's discussion, is uh, illustrative even today for every single evaluation that we perform that involves in a permanent impairment rating and therefore also involves an apportionment determination. Now, before we get into today's discussion, let's just ever so briefly uh, review where we've come from so far in this program. In session number one of this program, we talked about the Marlene Escobedo case and the relevance of that case as it relates to substantial medical evidence and apportionment, especially as the mechanism of injury applies to your apportionment approximate percentages. As you know, your apportionment determination in those cases where you provide for a permanent impairment rating, your apportionment approximate percentages must be based on what is referred to in the Escobedo case as relevant facts, relevant facts. Well, of all the relevant facts that go into your consideration of your permanent impair uh, of your apportionment approximate percentages, the relevant facts that are most relevant <laughs> have to do with the mechanism of injury. So in every single case that involves permanent impairment, explore, 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 explain, 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 and dig, dig, dig into details involving the mechanism of injury because the mechanism of injury is key data, is key relevant facts upon which your apportionment approximate percentages will be based. And when you're challenged on your apportionment approximate percentages, as you will be, you'll be able to comfortably and confidently rely upon relevant facts associated with the examinee's mechanism of injury, whether that injury be mild injury, moderate injury, or severe injury. And we talked about that at great length in session one of this program. In session two, we went into the Almarez and Guzman alternative impairment ratings, which allow us as qualified medical evaluators to depart from the strict application of the AMA guides in providing our permanent impairment rating and allow us to swim through <laughs> and peruse the entirety of the four corners of the AMA guides and coming up with alternative impairment ratings that, in our opinion, are more accurate descriptions of the examinee's true impairment than is the description that's provided for, for uh, under the strict application of the AMA guides. And it's the Almarez and Guzman cases that really blew the lid off of Senate Bill 899, which at the time had as its intent to reduce what were referred to as skyrocketing costs in workers' compensation. Well, all was going well and good until Almarez and Guzman came along, and those two lines of cases resulted in uh, a departure from the otherwise conservative and restrictive permanent impairment ratings provided for by the conservative AMA guides and allowed qualified medical evaluators to provide for impairment ratings for the same conditions, for the same conditions, but by uh, departing from the strict application of the AMA guides allowed for qualified medical evaluators to provide for much, 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 much higher 
permanent impairment ratings, often doubling, tripling, quadrupling, even uh, increasing by 10 times the permanent impairment rating compared to the permanent impairment rating provided for under the strict application of the AMA guides. So <laughs> while the legislature had as its intent in passing Senate Bill 899, that intent was quickly uh, thwarted by the Almarez and Guzman line of cases. And still today, even as this is being recorded some uh, decade or more beyond uh, the Almarez and Guzman cases, we as qualified medical evaluators still have at our disposal the option to provide for alternative impairment ratings thanks to Almarez and Guzman. In session three in the Cannon case, uh, we provided an example of an Almarez and Guzman alternative impairment rating wherein the qualified medical evaluator provided an alternative impairment rating for a condition that the examinee did not have. The qualified medical evaluator provide a permanent impairment rating for physical examination findings that the examinee did not have. And the qualified medical evaluator provided a permanent impairment rating for losses of activities of daily living that the examinee did not have. <laughs> so the Cannon case uh, is a perfect example of the liberal application of analogies and alternative impairment ratings that we can employ under Almarez and Guzman. And it was a specific application of an Almarez Guzman alternative impairment rating to uh, an industrial foot injury. Cannon had a foot injury. And so that was uh, a fascinating fascinating and eye-opening application uh, of Almarez and Guzman. Then we talked about the Kite case, which is another liberal application of Almarez and Guzman. Without Almarez and Guzman, we would never have uh, the principles employed in the Kite case, wherein the qualified medical evaluator departed from the specific instructions in the AMA guides that require a combination, a combining of multiple permanent impairments to multiple body parts. According to the AMA guides, multiple permanent impairments are to be combined using the combined values chart on page 604 of the AMA guides. Well, the combined values chart, as you know, has a compressive reductive effect when the multiple permanent impairments are totaled up in combination. So said another way, when you have a permanent impairment rating of 20% for the cervical spine and a permanent impairment rating of 10% for the shoulder and a permanent impairment rating for the lumbar spine of 20%, okay, 20, 10, and 20, when those permanent impairment ratings are passed through the combined values chart, the total impairment rating is compressed not to 50% impairment, 20, 10, and 20 equals 50, but the combined values chart compresses that to approximately, let's say, 42% impairment. So the combined values chart has a compressive, reductive effect on multiple impairments. Well, with the Kite case, the qualified medical evaluator defined the term synergistic effect, which provided for a departure from the use of the combined values chart and provided a basis for the qualified medical evaluator to add the, the impairments, to simply add the impairments 20 plus 10 plus 20 equals 50 versus the use of the combined values chart, which brought the permanent impairment rating to approximately 42%. So the use of the kite case where we add versus combine impairments is another example where qualified medical evaluators can escalate and increase the permanent impairment rating in those cases where it appears that the final impairment rating through the use of the combined values chart is not an accurate description of the examinee's true impairment. So the Kite case uh, was a fascinating uh, example of just another creative use uh, of the AMA guides. Then in our last session, we talked about the Melgoza-Garibay case 
And the Melgoza Garibay case was illustrative of the differences in thinking between liberal versus conservative QMEs. And I showed in the Melgoza Garibay case how liberal construction and a liberal consideration for the uh, needs of the applicant were considered at each fork in the road, at each fork in the road, wherein a financial determination is made by the qualified medical evaluator. Now, as qualified medical evaluators, I want to emphasize that we make medical determination. We don't make financial determination. But of course, our medical determinations determine financial issues for the examinee. So in the Melgoza Garibay case, at the financial juncture of AOE COE, where benefits for the examinee are either opened or closed, the qualified medical evaluator in this case opined liberally for FOR, for industrial injury, which opened up benefits for the examinee. And it was a liberal opinion because the uh, details surrounding the industrial injury uh, were quite vague and were in dispute at the time of the qualified medical evaluation. So the qualified medical evaluator opined liberally in favor of Ms. Garibay. Then at the permanent and stationary date, the qualified medical evaluator opined liberally which allowed an extension of Ms. Garibay's total temporary disability benefits. At the permanent and stationary date, when it came time to provide a permanent impairment rating, the qualified medical evaluator opined liberally, employing a uh, alternative impairment rating under Almarez and Guzman compared to a more conservative strict rating uh, directly from the AMA guides. And then finally, when it came to the apportionment determination, the qualified medical evaluator again opined liberally in favor of a high percentage of permanent impairment due to the industrial injury and a very low percentage of the permanent impairment to be due to other factors. So it was an example of liberal, liberal, liberal thinking and it illustrated the differences in thinking at the critical juncture points uh, between liberal versus conservative QMEs. Okay? <laughs> so. That was quite a bit, and that brings us to today's discussion, which is the Benson versus Kaiser Permanente case. Now, this is a classic case uh, that goes way back, maybe even 15 years ago, and uh, spanned the transition between uh, pre-Senate Bill 899 apportionment laws and rules and prior uh, and post-Senate Bill 899 uh, apportionment laws and rules. And this transition occurred right around 2004 and 2005 when Senate Bill 899 was passed. And the Benson case involved the controversy over the final uh, apportionment of the permanent impairment rating for Ms. Benson. And uh, this is a fascinating discussion that's going to provide for illustrative principles as to now how, under our new apportionment laws and rules, now how apportionment is to be provided for in cases where an examinee suffers two industrial injuries to the same body part when those industrial injuries become permanent and stationary at the same time. And this is a type of scenario that happens all the time. These, uh, these successive industrial injuries become permanent and stationary at the same time. In other words, these injuries overlap to such a point that the examinee receives medical treatment for, this, for both industrial injuries at the same time and the employee either improves or fails to improve as a result of both industrial injuries at the same time and the uh, injured worker is provided for a permanent impairment rating for the effects of both industrial injuries at the same time, and yet the apportionment of that final permanent impairment rating is uh, a point of contention even now between the parties, and this has to do with the changes in apportionment laws that occurred right around the passage of Senate Bill 899. So in today's discussion, let's get into some detail 
regarding apportionment issues and the Benson versus Kaiser Permanente case. Okay, so let's begin. This is the Benson versus Kaiser Permanente case. Now, Ms. Benson was a file clerk for Kaiser Permanente, and at some point in June, I think it was 2003, she suffered a specific incident of injury to her neck as she was reaching above to uh, lower some files uh, from overhead. She felt the pain in her neck, the pain worsened, and she required medical treatment, and this became uh, a claim for a specific incident of industrial injury. Well, she was uh, evaluated by a qualified medical evaluator who acknowledged that she indeed had suffered a specific incident of injury. But the qualified medical evaluator also opined for a period of cumulative trauma prior to and leading up to the specific incident of injury. So this is where the case uh, immediately became complicated by the addition of the second industrial injury in the form of a cumulative trauma injury. So actually, these injuries can be thought of as occurring in reverse with the cumulative trauma injury leading up to and contributing to the specific incident of injury that is the injury that resulted in the need for disability and the need for medical care. Okay, so key principle involved with the Benson case is that there's two separate and distinct industrial injuries, both to the same body part. Now, in the case of Ms. Benson, and I want you to think about this in terms of some of the cases that you've seen as well, uh, with Ms. Benson, she had a period of cumulative trauma to her neck, cervical spine, and then she had a specific incident of injury to her neck, cervical spine. Well, the subsequent medical treatment is treatment that was singularly addressing the combined effects of both of those injuries. In other words, you can't simply provide medical treatment to one aspect of the injury and not the other aspect of the injury because the examinee presents for medical treatment with a combination of effects of both circumstances, both the cumulative trauma, injurious effect upon her cervical spine and the injurious effect of the specific incident upon her cervical spine. So the medical treatment is provided for the combined effects of both of those injuries on her cervical spine. So it's difficult or impossible to separate medical treatment for one aspect of the injury compared to another aspect of the injury. So that's one circumstance where it's difficult to distinguish between uh, the effects of uh, both industrial injuries. Well, that difficulty is going to extend to the permanent impairment rating, and that difficulty is again going to extend to the apportionment determination where it becomes time to provide for a permanent impairment rating due to the effect of the cumulative trauma injury and the effect of the specific injury. So if it's difficult to distinguish between the medical treatment provided for each of these industrial injuries, do you think it would be difficult to provide an apportionment approximate percentage for each of those injuries? Of course, it is going to be very difficult. And the Benson case perfectly illustrates that difficulty and shows us how that difficulty is to be resolved. So the qualified medical evaluator opined that the injuries became permanent and stationary <clears throat> on the same date, and that makes sense. That makes sense that it would be difficult to distinguish a permanent and stationary date for injury A compared to a permanent and stationary date for injury B. Well, <clears throat> when it came time to provide for a permanent impairment rating, the qualified medical evaluator simply did his examination, made his measurements, did his tests, and came up with an assessment of Mrs. Benson's, Ms. Benson's permanent impairment permanent impairment or permanent disability. Well, because there was two successive industrial injuries, that permanent impairment rating had to be separated into 
the amount of permanent impairment caused by the cumulative trauma injury and the amount of permanent impairment that was caused by the specific incident of injury. Well, prior to Senate Bill 899, these types of situations were handled according to the Wilkinson Doctrine, the Wilkinson Doctrine, which provided for a combined award of permanent disability. So in other words, the qualified medical evaluator provided his permanent disability rating and that permanent disability rating was considered to be the combined effect of two industrial injuries. So prior to the passage of Senate Bill 899, these injuries were handled by the provision of a combined award of permanent disability, where the disability for injury A and the disability for injury B to the same body part were combined and the examinee received a combined award. Now, this became a point of contention because under new Senate Bill 899, apportionment laws were changed to provide for apportionment to causation, to causation where all of the causes, all of the causes of the final permanent disability have to be separated out and a specific portion or specific percentage of the permanent impairment has to be uh, delineated by the qualified medical evaluator such that the employer is responsible only for the percentage of permanent disability directly caused by the employment at the employer. <laughs> so the employer is only responsible for what the employer is responsible for and that requires a specific and unique and precise determination of the apportionment of the permanent impairment, okay? So in order to understand this a little bit better, let's review uh, new apportionment laws as provided for under post Senate Bill 899, Labor Code 4663. Okay, so Labor Code 4663 and its new post-Senate Bill 899 changes reads as follows. It tells us that apportionment of permanent disability shall be based on causation. Causation refers to the various multiple uh, causes of the final permanent disability. And now under Labor Code 4663, there's no limit to the number of causes that we can elaborate upon as contributory to the examinee's final permanent impairment rating. And typically, uh, in these cases, there are multiple contributors, multiple causes of the uh, employee's final permanent disability uh, rating. So, uh, Labor Code 4663 now tells us that we're required to address the issue of permanent disability shall also address the issue of causation of the permanent disability. So let's read that. It tells us that a physician who prepares a report which addresses the issue of permanent disability. Okay, so this applies in those cases wherein you determine that your examinee has a permanent impairment rating. Okay, when you determine that the examinee has a permanent impairment rating, you shall also in that report address the issue of the various causes of that permanent disability. And the purpose of this is to determine what portion of the permanent disability is the employer responsible for. The employer is responsible only for the portion that they're responsible for, and the employee is responsible for everything else. So when it comes time to provide a permanent impairment or permanent disability rating for the examinee, that financial award, the value of that permanent disability rating is gonna be divided up, up amongst various payers, including the employer. So all of the parties are very keen and attuned to these apportionment approximate percentages because it tells the parties how the permanent disability pie is going to be sliced and who's responsible for the cost of each slice of the pie. So it's required by law under Labor Code 4663 that we address apportionment. 
Now, this does not also simultaneously qualify your apportionment discussion as a complexity factor, and this is a confusion that many qualified medical evaluators have. They feel that uh, simply addressing the issue of apportionment in their report qualifies as a complexity factor, but it does not. The complexity factor for apportionment under CCR 9795 is very specific and very detailed beyond the simple requirement by law that we address apportionment in each and every one of those cases wherein we provide for a permanent impairment rating. Okay? And then in terms of greater detail regarding causation, Labor Code 4663 tells us that in order for a physician's report to be complete on the issue of permanent disability, in other words, the permanent disability discussion is not complete simply after you've provided the permanent impairment rating. No, that's part A of your permanent disability uh, discussion. You must also add in part B, which they tell us must include an apportionment determination. We as physicians shall make an apportionment determination by finding what approximate percentage of the permanent disability was caused by the direct effect of injury arising out of and incurring in the course of employment and what approximate percentage of permanent disability was caused by other factors both before and subsequent to the industrial injury including prior industrial injuries. And that exactly was the case with Ms. Benson, where she had the specific incident of injury in June 2003. But before that, it says here prior, both before and subsequent to the industrial injury. So she had the cumulative trauma period before the specific incident of injury. And that qualified as a prior industrial injury. So according to new apportionment law under 4663, which was different, compared to old apportionment law prior to passage of Senate Bill 899, the qualified medical evaluator was required by law to provide for a permanent impairment rating for the cumulative trauma effect of the injury and the specific effect or the effect of the specific injury on her cervical spine. In the Benson case, the qualified medical evaluator provided for a 50% apportionment percentage to the cumulative trauma injury and a 50% apportionment percentage to the specific incident of injury. So let's uh, dissect this a little bit. Qualified medical evaluator provided for uh, a permanent impairment rating and then divided the permanent impairment rating 50% due to the cumulative trauma and 50% to the specific incident of injury. So under prior Senate Bill 899, under the Wilkinson Doctrine, that permanent disability rating was not required to be separated out. But following uh, the passage of Senate Bill 899 and New Labor Code 4663, were required by law to separate out each of the specific causes of the permanent disability. In this case, the qualified medical evaluator separated out 50% due to the cumulative trauma injury and 50% due to the specific incident of injury. And this has implications into the financial resolution of the permanent disability award. Whereas before under Wilkinson, the combined award rated much higher in terms of monetary value than does two separate awards that total the same permanent disability rating as the combined award, okay? So let's elaborate on that uh, a little bit. Okay, so let's read directly from the case. And remember that this was a case that spanned the time period around the passage of Senate Bill 899, whereas Miss Benson uh, suffered industrial injury in 2003, but she was not evaluated until approximately 2005 during the transition of the passage of Senate Bill 899. And so there was confusion as to how the permanent disability was to be apportioned. And the workers' compensation judge, in his wisdom at the time and in this transition period, 
provided for a combined award, a combined award, a non-separated out award uh, of the permanent disability. And this became a, a point of contention with the employer who was faced with uh, paying the charges. Okay, so let's read from the case. The case tells us that part of the argument had to do with uh, this dispute. And they tell us that it's undisputed that Ms. Benson's combined permanent disability rating is 62%. So that's what the qualified medical evaluator came up with based upon his physical examination, his measurements, his findings, uh, came up with a 62% permanent disability rating after adjustment for age and occupation. Now, Kaiser Permanente argued that the 2004 workers' compensation reform uh, legislation enacted as Senate Bill 899 eliminated or abrogated the Wilkinson Doctrine and necessitated two separate awards of 31% permanent disability based on the qualified medical evaluator's apportionment of 50% of the permanent disability due to the cumulative trauma and 50% due to the specific incident of injury. So 31 and 31 is 50% of 62. So the Kaiser argued for two separate 31% awards. So you might wonder to yourself, what's the difference? 31 plus 31 is 62, but the contention has to do with the higher monetary award of the combined award, the 62% award, compared, compared to the additive value of two 31% awards, even though the additive uh, disability rating is the same. The additive monetary value is far from uh, the same. So uh, they argued for two 31% permanent disability awards. And of course, Ms. Benson argued that Wilkinson had survived Senate Bill 899. And she argued for the imposition of a singer higher value uh, award based on a combined rating of 62% of permanent disability. And initially, the workers' compensation judge was compelled to uh, opine for a single combined award, which totaled $67,016 based upon the combined permanent disability rating of 62% permanent disability. Okay, so Kaiser was faced with the potential liability of uh, $67,000 for the single combined permanent disability award of 62%. So Kaiser then uh, filed a petition for reconsideration, which the board granted. Thereafter, on reconsideration, the board issued an en banc decision. An en banc decision means that going forward, this decision is binding upon all workers' compensation judges and all workers' compensation appeals board. So this is a binding opinion upon the system as a whole. This makes uh, the Benson a precedential uh, type of case. Where a majority of the board ruled that the rule in Wilkinson is not consistent with the new requirement that apportionment be based on causation. And therefore, Wilkinson is no longer generally applicable. Rather, we now must determine an apportion to the cause of disability for each industrial injury. And in applying its uh, decision, the board concluded that based upon the AME's determination that each of the two injuries was equally responsible, 50% and 50%, for her current level of permanent disability, she's entitled to receive a separate award of 31% permanent disability for each of the injuries. So let's see how this impacted the financial conclusion of Ms. Benson's uh, settlement award. The board then amended the workers' compensation judge's findings and award to provide for two separate awards of $24,605 each. 24 and 24 is 48, whereas the prior award was 67, a roughly $19,000 difference <laughs> by separating out the same permanent disability rating, which was 
into two separate 31% ratings compared to a single combined 62% disability rating. So a significant financial consequence of this apportionment division. The board's two awards entitled Benson to a total of $49,210 with each award payable at $185 per week for 133 weeks. Whereas the combined award entitled Benson to a much higher total of 67,000 payable at the same rate, but for a much longer period of time of 362 weeks. And this difference is caused by the nonlinear benefit schedule which more generously compensates more severe or higher levels of permanent disability. So you might wonder, okay, so what does this have to do with me as a qualified medical evaluator? In these cases where you uh, have multiple injuries to the same body parts, the higher compensatory award could be provided for in those cases where the permanent disability award is provided as a combined award compared to when the permanent disability is apportioned between various causes, the various uh, industrial injuries that contribute to the final permanent disability rating. And both the applicant and the applicant attorney will argue for a combined award because of its higher monetary value. And the defense attorney will argue for uh, separate awards because of its lower monetary value. So that's going to introduce a, a new scenario, and that is the difficulty in coming up with apportionment approximate percentages for each of the successive industrial injuries. Is it possible that there may be circumstances where you as a qualified medical evaluator cannot, within reasonable medical probability, come up with apportionment approximate percentages for each of the industrial injuries? and support those approximate percentages with substantial medical evidence and relevant facts, it seems possible that uh, this could be very difficult and it could be very difficult to separate out how much of the permanent disability is due to injury A and how much is due to permanent disability B. I mean, how would you actually do that? How did the qualified medical evaluator come up with 50-50? compared to 60, 40, 70, 30. In other words, you can see uh, that this is a, a bit difficult. So let's talk about how uh, qualified medical evaluators have handled this difficulty and where this difficulty uh, is going now and how this difficulty is being required to be resolved uh, now, even though it is extremely difficult. So over the years, qualified medical evaluators have argued uh, that it's very, very difficult to determine how much of the permanent disability is due to industrial injury A and how much is due to industrial injury B because how can you make such a determination and qualify that determination as substantial medical evidence? I think you can see that inherently there is some difficulty and some perhaps speculation involved in such a determination. So qualified medical evaluators have looked for an out to this requirement that we provide uh, apportionment approximate percentages for each of the industrial injuries and, and rather have relied upon the single combined award by stating that it's not possible, it's not possible to separate out the various causes of the permanent disability. Well, in the Benson case, they addressed this difficulty and they set the stage for some uh, future policy as to how this difficulty is to be handled. They tell us that we agree with the board that a system of apportionment based on causation requires that each distinct industrial injury be separately compensated based upon its individual contribution to a permanent disability. And in the Benson case, it was 50 and 50, okay? They also agree that there may be some limited circumstances, key phrase, limited circumstances, not universal circumstances, not ubiquitous circumstances, not frequent circumstances, but limited circumstances, which are not present here in the Benson case, where the evaluating physician cannot parcel out within reasonable medical probability 
the approximate percentages to which each distinct industrial injury causally contributed to the employee's overall permanent disability. In other words, there may be those situations where this determination, this separating out, cannot be done. And you can see that that's uh, a likely scenario uh, in these cases. Well, in such limited circumstances, when the physician cannot parcel out the apportionment percentages and the employer fails <coughs> to meet its burden of proof of establishing, establishing such apportionment, a combined award of permanent disability may still be justified. So how qualified medical evaluators handled this difficulty and the out that they found around this obstacle, this requirement, that each industrial injury be separately apportioned. Qualified medical evaluators have incorporated the phrase inextricably intertwined. And what this refers to, this phrase inextricably intertwined, this refers to the fact that these two industrial injuries, which caused the same need for medical care, which caused the same combined need for temporary disability, which caused the same combined, contributed to the same combined permanent disability rating or permanent disability award, they cannot be separated out within reasonable medical probability that the two injuries are so inextricably intertwined that it's impossible to determine how much disability is due to injury A and how much disability is due to injury B. By using the phrase inextricably intertwined, the qualified medical evaluator can provide for a single combined much higher permanent disability award, thereby satisfying the needs of the applicant and the applicant attorney compared to uh, going through the difficult decision making of qualifying the separate apportionment approximate percentages as substantial medical evidence and satisfying, of course, the needs of the defense attorney, the claims administrator, and ultimately satisfying the needs of the employer. So through the years and through the use of the phrase inextricably intertwined, qualified medical evaluators have escaped this provision of Labor Code 4663 and this phrase inextricably intertwined has allowed qualified medical evaluators to provide for a single combined award compared to two separate and distinct awards that result in a lower monetary value. However, over the years, and as the number of cases that employ the phrase inextricably intertwined have accumulated, uh, the system is taking uh, 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 a serious look at qualified medical evaluators' failure to address the apportionment approximate percentages. And so let's see now where this new trend is taking us. Well, it's taking us to a point where the phrase inextricably intertwined may no longer be acceptable and it may no longer be acceptable for qualified medical evaluators to shirk the difficult medical decision making involved with providing for separate permanent impairment ratings for each of two industrial injuries. So in explaining this phenomenon, uh, there is an article, a 2018 article, which uh, specifically addressed uh, the universal use of the phrase inextricably intertwined and talked about uh, perhaps the long overdue demise of this uh, phrase, which allows qualified medical evaluators to provide for a single combined award versus two separate awards. This article tells us that a number of decisions from the WCAB in 16 and 17 indicate a marked shift related to apportionment involving multiple injuries under Labor Codes 4663 and 64, which was reflected in the Benson decision. So there's a shift uh, in, in uh, apportionment opinions as that opinion was described above in the Benson decision. Recent Benson decisions from the WCAB in 16 and 17 evidence a rejection of the cryptic conclusory mantra of qualified medical evaluators of inextricably intertwined 
which is used by evaluating physicians to justify an exception to the Benson requirement that permanent disability re related to multiple and distinct injuries must be apportioned and therefore not combined. So qualified medical evaluators have employed this phrase inextricably intertwined to provide for a single combined award versus two separate uh, permanent disability awards. But this is now being challenged uh, at the levels of the court and a single combined award where the qualified medical evaluator fails to apportion between two separate distinct injuries uh, is being uh, made much, much more difficult by the courts. So here's some of the key findings and key points uh, that have evolved throughout 2016 and 2017. Tell us that Labor Code sections 4663 and 64 as well as the Benson decision require that permanent disability attributable to multiple and successive injuries to the same body parts or condition must be separately apportioned between the multiple injuries as opposed to a single combined award except in very limited circumstances. Limited circumstances and qualified medical evaluators were exploiting the narrowed and limited circumstances through the use of the phrase inextricably intertwined. Well, in those limited circumstances or in rare instances where the evaluating physicians assert or allege that they, that they cannot medically parcel out the approximate percentage to which each separate injury is causally contributing to the applicant's overall permanent disability to the same body part or condition, he or she must provide an opinion based upon a plausible non-conclusory analysis. In other words, the use of the phrase inextricably intertwined is a conclusory phrase because it does not explain how and why the two injuries are inextricably uh, intertwined and how and why the qualified medical evaluator cannot parcel out the individual disability ratings. So it must provide a non-conclusory analysis and reasoning as to why the qualified medical evaluator is unable to do so in order for the opinion to constitute substantial medical evidence. So in other words, our apportionment approximate percentages must qualify as substantial medical evidence. And in those situations where you opine that the apportionment approximate percentages cannot be parceled out, well, that opinion itself has to be qualified as substantial medical evidence by providing a non-conclusory analysis that's plausible and it must include how and why reasoning as to why though the, those disability uh, awards cannot be separated out. So they tell us that in terms of substantial medical evidence, the limited circumstance exception to Benchen should not be deemed triggered or established by a physician merely stating the permanent disability attributable to multiple injuries is inextricably intertwined. In other words, that's no longer sufficient. That's no longer sufficient to establish a single combined award. To do so would serve to transform the limited circumstance exception recognized in Benson into a more general rule, which therefore would be inconsistent with current case law involving labor codes 4663 and 4664. So doctors, isn't that fascinating? And this Benson case kind of brings this, uh, this program, the uh, Presidential Cases and Medical Legal Game Changers, it kind of brings this program and the topics uh, discussed in this program full circle because whereas every single one of the cases that we've discussed up till now, such as Escobedo, Almarez Guzman, Ken and Kite, Melgoza Garibay, all of those cases are examples of cases where the uh, costs have escalated, where permanent impairment ratings have doubled, tripled, quadrupled, where uh, analogies to conditions that the examinee does not even have have been employed in an effort by qualified medical evaluators to increase and escalate 
uh, the financial costs of these cases. Well, here in the Benson case, initially, where as qualified medical evaluators attempted to do the same thing through the use of the phrase inextricably inter intertwined and therefore providing for a single combined much higher value award, now, now we're seeing some reversal where uh, as a result of the Benson case, uh, things are going the other direction in terms of lowering costs and lowering benefits provided to uh, injured workers because the principle of the Benson case tells us that each date of injury must be given its own permanent impairment rating and qualified medical evaluators can no longer escape this requirement through the use of the phrase inextricably intertwined. This can no longer be applied or relied upon by evaluating physicians and therefore evaluating physicians at least as regards to the apportionment approximate percentages uh, are required to provide for two separate ratings, which has as its effect a lowering on the financial compensation provided for uh, the injured worker. So isn't that fascinating? It seems that now as a result of the Benson decision, uh, there's at least one uh, presidential case that results in a reduction in employee benefits compared to many, many of the other presidential cases which had the net effect of increasing benefits provide, provided to uh, injured workers here in the state of California. So doctors, I hope this helps you. Uh, these cases provide for you a tremendous insight into the options uh, and requirements and obligations that we as qualified medical evaluators have in providing for opinions and conclusions that are accurate. Now, the whole purpose of the Almarez and Guzman cases and the Kite cases and the Cannon cases, and even now the Benson cases, is to provide opinions and conclusions that are the most accurate representation of the examinee's true condition. And in those cases where you feel that the examinee's true condition is not adequately encompassed, through one of the descriptions, charts, tables, or chapters in the AMA guides, then you have uh, the discretion to roam throughout the four corners of the AMA guides to come up with something that is more accurate. And this many times results in a much higher permanent impairment rating, even if that permanent impairment rating must be apportioned between multiple causative factors. You still, the, the still, the final permanent compensation provided to the uh, employee may still be much, much higher, even when it's apportionment under the provisions provided under the Benson case. So doctors, I hope this helps you and I hope you found uh, much uh, practical application uh, in today's program. So for now, I wanna sign off on this program. I wanna thank you for taking the time to join me and I look forward to being with you on future presentations as well. For now, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'm wishing you best of success in your career as a qualified medical evaluator.